It, yes, this is uh, some of the, so we're moving on to the second deck. Um, we'll pull in pieces, uh, but basically the nice thing about synchronous and asynchronous synchronous learning is that we can push pause on learning. So we are messing with time. We're messing with time and space in hybrid learning. So we can push pause on learning, and this brings up broader questions for when is learning, um, you know, what's real learning and what's not. Uh, is a student learning more if face-to-face -face in class, I grill you, do you get the answer? Or are they learning when they have time to pause, reflect, and think about their response, and then you know, <coughs> modify or change the response? So with, with online blended hybrid learning, we have an opportunity to mess around with space and time. So we're talking about synchronous or asynchronous learning. There's a nice model that is out there that I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, the reason why I value this model is because it, <coughs> Uh, those of us that are feeling like I don't really uh, understand online learning or hybrid or blended learning or have my own questions, or some of us, we, we look at technology and we think it's a foreign language and it, it, we, it's not approachable. What I like about the model we're going to talk about is that it creates a space for us and, and it celebrates our expertise. Okay, So um, what's content? What's content knowledge? What is content knowledge? Copy memorization or attention or application. For each of you, what is content knowledge? Yeah, just yeah, so it's your facts, it's your information. I mean, you you're you're hired because you're an expert in your content. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, and it you know your field backwards and forwards, and it's your job to bring that to your students, bring that understanding, that expertise to your students. What's pedagogy? I love talking. About, my kids are in a, a pre-service teacher program. I'm always like. Do, 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 pedagogy, pedagogy, okay, what is pedagogy? And then you see them all sit there like, uh, so what's what's pedagogy? Study how to teach. Yeah, it's to learn. the tools to learn, it's study of how to teach, the science of teaching and learning, okay? So the, what I like is that, you know, for those of you that are, are Venn diagram fans, um, you know, this is your content area knowledge. So this is everything you know about biology or business. This is everything I know about accounting. And this is everything I know about pedagogy or good teaching and learning. What's this middle part here called? PC. Yeah, what is that? So that middle ground we call PCK, pedagogical content knowledge. What's in there for us that are, are very astute in the ways of the Venn diagram? Students. Our students are there, but what sort of, as academics, we're very good at partialing out things. We're very good at segmenting constructs and partialing out things. So if we've got, here's our content, everything we know about content, here's our pedagogy. So this is everything I know about accounting, and this is everything I know about teaching and learning. So there's some pieces that overlap that I could say, okay, this is a better, you know, in accounting, in my accounting class, this is a better way to teach accounting, okay? Make it a little bit simpler. I teach children, I teach math, and then that PCK, the, the pedagogical content knowledge is I teach kids math. So there is straight up good teaching and learning. There's good pedagogy, but then there's also the content side. And when those two mesh, there are certain things that for my content, for my discipline, work better. You know, so there's certain things that if I'm teaching eighth grade English language arts, they work better than if I were teaching, you know, uh, a, a collegiate, an undergrad level bio class. Okay. So we, we know that area. The other thing that I like about this is our content, you know, the reason why I like this model is that it validates what we already know. Okay, so we already know our content. You're, you're here because you're an expert in your content area. Okay, I'm not. I'm not an expert in your content area. You know it backwards and forwards. That's why you're getting that paycheck. The pedagogy, that's experience. You know teaching and learning. You know when your kids are resonating, when they're learning it, that the, what you call it, the psychic personal connection? Um, interpersonal. The interpersonal psychic. The group thing. The, huh? group thing. So the group thing. So if you're if you're feeling that vibe, okay, you know when good teaching and learning is learning's happening. When you teach that class again, you got different kids, but you're searching for that piece again. So you're looking for that overlap when you know you're teaching what you have to. So this is already validating all the good stuff that we already do. Then what we realize is that there's a whole nother lens here, okay? So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
there's a whole other lens. So this is our circle. Here's our content knowledge. Here's our pedagogical content knowledge. Here's the PCK in the middle. In the sciences, PCK is huge right now. It's starting to enter the math field. But pedagogical content knowledge is saying, OK, you know your content area. You know your pedagogy. Those are overlapping a little bit. But then what we do is, this is the, the TPAC model. We bring in this technology lens. And we're saying, OK, here's the technology lens. There's certain aspects or uses of technology that fit a little bit better with the other two areas. And our goal is to get you here, OK? Because there, there are some of us that are great and experts in our content area. We know how to teach. Some of us are better teachers than others. Um, but then the technology side, some of us can do that dance well. We can do that dance with technology in our classrooms well. We can use you know, the smart board. We can go into the online spaces. Some of us have that and we can use it well, and others have challenges with it. But what I like about this model is that it's valuing and validating all of the expertise that we already have. It's just one other lens they're adding on to it. Okay? Um, this model is known as the TPAC model. It's te technological, pedagogical, content area knowledge. This is out of Michigan State. Uh, Mishra and Kohler basically put this model together. There's a lot of stuff about TPAC online. The, the reason why I love TPAC is, once again, when I come in and I work with people and they view this technology side because we don't have a lot of expertise, we view that as like a foreign language or almost impossible. And we're blinded by the technology side. So when we go to teach, we have this belief set that I, I can't do that. I can't go there. But the thing to keep in mind is that you're already an expert. And a lot of things. And all we're trying to do is how do we mesh this in? Okay? So it's not bringing everything in. It's what are small aspects of technology that I can bring in, test it out, see if it works. If it doesn't work, kick it out, try something new. Okay? So this is the TPAC model. And all we're trying to do is figure out how do I bring in a little bit of technology into it to help with those other areas. Yeah. Uh, you can write a paper on this. There needs to be another circle, and that is social interaction. Because in the technology, the content and the pedagogical piece, yeah. um, even online, you can have uh, these uh, virtual social environments. Mm -hmm. And my field, UNH, claims to be the premier business program online, and they say that they have a MBA program which is equal or better to their on-ground program entirely online. And they say the only way to do that you is you to blended learning yep. and, and in terms of uh, seminars in the summer and weekly face-to-face -face interaction through uh, uh, various technologies. Yeah. And they said without that social component, yeah. Of the online experience, it would be an inferior program. So add a fourth circle there. Yeah. Well, I think. Social interaction. But I think this social and interaction. You can call it your model. No, oh, I, I got enough on my plate right now. We've already established that. Um, I think. Uh, I think. I would say the social side is built into the pedagogy. You know, I'm a social constructivist. I think that I agree with you. You need that piece. I disagree with you and H thinking that. Um, the online, that socializing part, I think the socialization is key. I disagree with them thinking that it can happen totally online with the current technologies. Okay? With the current technologies, I think you still need that face to face. Technology is getting pretty good though. That's, you know, I mean, we're getting very quick to. Anybody here read Ready Player One by Ernest Klein? Yeah, put it on your book list. You know, I think with AR, VR, I think we're getting to the point where. We could have students pretty quickly, whether we like it or not, they're strapping in with the goggles and they it it looks like you are there face to face. So I think right now we're missing it, but I think there's a lot of institutions, that's why Facebook spent all that money on Oculus Rift. They're looking at the technology and how do we bring in AR VR. So I think right now it doesn't exist. You still need that face to face, you know, but I think that might not be the case five, ten years from now. Um, so uh, some of the other prompts that I have up on the Google Doc uh, and questions that I'm asking throughout. Um, if we look at that pedagogical content area knowledge, the PCK, what are ways that we can fill in that technology part? You know, what are ways that we can build on that technology part? 
we've been talking about this throughout the day. maybe we need groups in house that build stuff for us and run it. maybe we need opportunities to build it up on our own. but how do we build in that technology piece? how do we build in that part that may be missing you know or we need to build up our skill set? um so one of the other things i wanted to unpack is uh synchronous and asynchronous learning. you know now we're messing with hybrid we're messing around with space. They're not just here, they're off in the ether, they're online, they're running around, they, we might meet up every once in a while, but we're also messing around with time. Okay? And time can be a very powerful uh, element, it can be a power, powerful weapon, it matters what we do with time. Like how can time now be a teaching tool? Okay? So what happens when we are learning synchronously? Our kids are in front of us, they're learning face to face, we know when they're tuned in. We know we've been trained, we've been socialized at this point that when we look at an inter, when we are here face to face, I look you in the eyes and I nod and you're like, oh, I get it. You could not even be there mentally, but we know like when the person looks at you, like you nod and it's like, oh yeah, I get what you're saying. And I have no idea what this guy's talking about right now. So what do we do synchronously? What do we do when everything is on the same time point? We're all there at the same time. But then what happens when we move to that asynchronous environment? What happens when you put out a prompt at the beginning of the week and say, watch this video, read these pieces, and I want you to respond back in the online discussion forums three times, okay? What happens when, when students take a little bit more time to think through and really formulate an idea, you know? Are they not learning as much as the people that immediately respond? Uh, are they learning less? Are they slower students? Are they more thoughtful students? What is the challenge as they learn at different speeds and paces? The other, the other challenge is, one of the huge issues that I have is um, in online discussion forums, discussion threads. Um, when you put the prompt out there, you'll, you'll have a student respond and then what you'll normally see in an online discussion forum is you have one student respond and then like, the remainder of the kids basically come in and be like, I agree, I agree, I agree with the person above. I, and you get the same piece. What do you learn then? Um, the, a lot of research also suggests that in an online discussion forum, when the professor, you know, when the instructor, when the expert goes in and says something, everybody's gonna agree with you. You know, everybody's, yeah, oh, I agree, I agree. So I, for the most part, I stay out of the online discussion forums. I watch what they're doing. Um, you know, I can like their comments and stuff like that. I can plus one their comments. I can reference and bring their comments into class or talk about it online. But I stay out because I don't want you to basically restate what I had to say. Um, one of the other interesting pieces also with asynchronous or online discussion threads while we're here is that um, you'll have the kid that likes to be uh, uh, a stick in the mud, the, 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 the problem maker. So out of like a 12, 13 week class, they'll be like involved in the discussion and then the kid will get bored. So then they basically start picking fights in the, dis in the discussion forum, the threads. Have people seen that before? They just become the naysayer and they just agitate, trying to like stir issues and stuff like that. Um, what do you do with that? Um, in a class face to face, you can see that and, and, and work on it and try to work with them and talk through what their challenges are. So when we talk about hybrid blended learning, we have these opportunities to move different ideas to different spaces, okay? We have the opportunity to mess around with space, mess around with time. Uh, we have challenges about uh, you know, what happens when we're synchronously, we can talk face to face, we can spend 10 minutes in class talking through an idea, um, whereas we can also go together online in video conference and we can talk over a Google Doc and get our ideas out on paper. Um, so what do you do with these changes in space and place? What do you do when there's changes in time? Mm -hmm. Or you can suspend time. Or what I like to do often is build in opportunities for my students to push pause on learning. So ask them a question, have a prompt, and then say, okay, you know, I want your initial thoughts, I want your initial 200 words you know, or initial 100 words, or, you know, I want your initial ideas, and then I want you to stop and think about it for two days, and then come back and respond to me. Um, you know, try and have deeper level thought, think about it, you know, read the materials, and then give it two days to let it sink in, 
but how are different ways that you can modify time as a way for your kids to think more deeply or play with their ideas? Um, and this is a, a, a pedagogical tool. This is an opportunity that we have if we use technology. Um, so what are some of the challenges that exist that we, as we do this? If we have kids that are working, they are collaborating, they're working across space and place, what are challenges that we have when we're messing around with time like that? We already talked about the quizzes and we don't know if kids are doing it well and they're, it's their work. What other challenges exist? Yeah. Well, Bill and Melinda Gates have given a ton of money yep. to Khan Academy. Yep. You have a asynchronous presentation model where you look at the PowerPoint slide and it's as though someone is, is talking to you over your shoulder mm -hmm. as you engage in the class and they break it down into modules mm -hmm. that are shorter than a typical class size. Yep. Uh, what do you think about that approach? I like that approach. That's the third part of the talk today is creating, <laughs> is creating <laughs> well said, I'll give you your five dollars later. Um, <laughs> that's one of those things that I, I'm going to try and suggest that you create screen captures, screen cast later. Create those think through models because in teaching and learning, we know the think aloud is very powerful. The think aloud helps support metacognition. And so if you have a time where you can, you know, if you have my words, the words coming out of my mouth to the slide decks, it helps express it. If you have your PowerPoint slides, yes, you use them in your lecture with your classroom. If you have your PowerPoint deck and your kids can have access to not just the slides, but you talking through them, it's pretty powerful. You know, how do we create that and give that to the kids? And also, how can we do that in class as a lecture? Um, so the last part of this, what can we do with time? You know, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this. What happens when we play with time, we modify time? It sounds like a sci-fi novel, but we really have that opportunity now. You, you know? wormhole? Yeah, you know, uh, Southern is working on a wormhole right now. <laughs> Along with Blue Jeans, there is a time travel device that they will have. Um, so what can we do with time? How can we modify time to help support learners? And how can time be an assessment device? I mean, we could push pause on learning, but Maybe we say, okay, well, I don't want you responding immediately. You know, I want to see later because I want to see deeper thought. Um, time is also good for reflection. You know, uh, in our fields, we're starting to hear more about dispositions or affective variables or soft skills. You know, how do we push pause on learning and give kids time to reflect and really have deeper thought and think about their own feelings about it? Time might provide us that opportunity, but then also, one of the most challenging pieces in all of our fields is synthesis. How do we push pause on learning and give kids time metacognitively to take a break and synthesize that information? Because most of our kids have been trained in K-12 and in higher ed that get the immediate answer, regurgitate that answer out for the test, then the teacher is done, they don't want to hear anymore. You don't want that immediate answer. You want them to sit, think, really decompress, understand what it really means for them. Yeah. In my school, the average student works 35 hours a week. I am beginning to wonder whether the higher level synthesis on complex systems theory and yeah. integration is even possible when you are totally and completely exhausted. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe that maybe maybe that time that pause is a chance for them to take a nap. You know. Yeah. You know what was it? How long is the pause? It's up to you. Yeah, I mean, it's well. I, most of the, most of my thinking about that metacognitive pause is that the kid says, "I want it. I want to push pause on this." But maybe it's it could be instructor directed. You need to pause. Um, that's one of the things that once again you got to think about your own content. You got to think about your own classes and your kids. What works best? And maybe you say they got enough on their plate now. I'm not. You know, I don't. I don't want deeper level learning right now. I want you to survive this sequence of classes. How do you handle it yourself? Personally, in my own life? No, you no. Own teaching. Oh, in my own teaching, what I'll do is I will build in, uh, I have, in my face-to-face -face classes, I have like online discussions, and so what I'll do is I'll either in class, I've done it one, or, one way uh, or the other, I'll have in class, I'll have a prompt and say, here is like a giant probing question that we have at the end of our class, 
i want you to basically go online and debrief and think about the question i pose at the end of class and i don't want your response for forty eight hours i want you to think about it, i want you to read a little bit and then give me two days because i'll see him once a week you know i want you to think about it um i will also have ah either or the flipped classroom model is i'll have materials i want you to read and my lecture stuff online think about it, here's questions that i will start class with so it's like a bridge to get into class but i try to build i try to be cognizant of time when i develop online discussions and say here's how often i want you to respond when i want you to respond and when it's too much um being cognizant of time i want to give you all a break uh take about 10 minutes get some water use the restrooms we'll start back up uh in 10 minutes and we'll talk about some of the behind the scenes stuff and then we'll eat What's going on? How was the flight in? It wasn't bad. DC was congested. Did uh, it fly well? They were both good. It was the issue on the way out of DC here. There was a lot of turbulence, and so Katie was in the back of the plane with the babies. Jack's like on the iPad. We still have breakfast up right there, but they're just bringing us. Where did you play? Bradley. Yeah, I went from uh, Charleston to Bradley, but we stopped off at Reagan. And so the guy basically said, "Hey, on the way in and out, we're gonna have turbulence. It's awesome, you know." Yeah, well, that's it. That's why I say all the time, like, I'll save my kids and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And when I was teaching, I, I would save my kids, and I would have people that were just out of undergrad, and then I would have people.
and then we're going to get started up again. We're going to spend about 20, 25 minutes. I'm going to take a look at some of the tools that I use. So we're going to take, watch yourself there. Take about 20, 25 minutes. We're going to talk about some of the tools that I use. I'll give you an overview. I know that there's other tools that are here. There's other tools that are proprietary. I'll show you what I do and some of the resources I use. And then I want to, at quarter after 11, I want to open it up and have a dialogue between the people in the room, the people that are online, feel a bit disenfranchised. Um, so in my talk about online blended learning and discussions, I'm doing a poor job of integrating the people that are here uh, remotely. Uh, now we have, we're trying out blue jeans. We're trying out a new software to bring people in. Um, so there's a lot of great discussion happening already online. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the tools that I use and give you an idea of the practices I use, and then we will bring in the virtual people. Uh, so we can have dialogue here, and I'd like for it to be more of discussion with, you know, across individuals in the room. Uh, so one of the prompts that we had online that was intriguing, who is responding? Can you mic up and just put the mic back there? There you go. Yes, so we have a question from uh, Marianne Evans who asks, uh, how do you grade discussion threads? She has anonymous discussion forums on various topics, about 20, and she gives them credit for posting about 50 words a morning. Yeah, uh, most of my discussion threads uh, or, or posts that I have students give, I want their writing to be minimal. You know, I want 200, 300 words. I don't want long diatribes. Uh, I also have students that will blog. They'll post their, their, their comments and their feedback openly. Um, but I, I'm from the school of thought that I, I find it challenging to grade reflections and grade posts and grade the threads. Mm -hmm. I have a very simple three, two, one rubric that I'll give. Uh, basically, the zero is you haven't responded at all. The three is you are uh, you have content. It relates back to content from the course. Mm -hmm. You've had your own initial thoughts as part of it. Um, I you keep my grading very minimal. I know that not everybody agrees. I, I, you know, I have colleagues that have reflective posts that students write, and they have this long, extensive rubric that they use. Um, I know that Greg, what you use Craves? I did. Um, I don't. No, um, when I face face class, I don't grade. I don't. I might give them a one or zero for some up. And I'll do that on my discussions too. Or, you know, it's like that's the normal dialogue of class. It's not. Don't think that you have to grade your class in dialogue. You do that in your regular face to face teaching. No, it's just, you know, you have to be present in class. Mm -hmm. And if you use the discussion forms as, as your way of meeting, that means if you're not doing the forms, you're just not showing up to class. Yeah. My, my, so I, I do binary. You either did or you didn't. Yeah. Mine's a little bit more than binary. I'll do the 0, 1, 2, 3 or 0, 1, 2. And like I said, 0 is you didn't do anything. The 1 is you showed up. Um, I, I look at content. I look at your own initial point. Does it relate back to the discussion in class? Sometimes I'll add in a point for, did you respond to somebody else? You know, sometimes I want them to respond to an idea from another student or colleague if I want them to push each other uh, and they're thinking I'll add that in. Uh, the only other element that I add into my rubric sometimes is we were talking before about time. I'll add in a, a point or, or part of the 0, 1, 2, 3 rubric would say that you have to respond at three time points throughout the week or the, the life of the discussion cycle, I'll say. So I want you to have an initial post and then post at the end of the cycle or an initial post in the middle and at the end. So, but it's pretty, it's a little bit more than binary. I'll get the zero, one, two, three, um, just to see are they interacting and just discussing. So what's your tool to track that? I mean, do you have to keep a spreadsheet going chick, 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 chick? No, what I'll do is uh, if I sat down once a week, I'll look at the discussion thread. Um, sometimes, as, as posts are coming in, I use Google Plus and Community so I can like plus one their stuff. Um, what I also do is if I, you know, the, the week gets ahead of me and I go back to see is the kid responding, um, I'll go in and do a search for their name and see how many times they responded to what they did that week. But it's very minimal. Um, you know, it's basically see are they going in, are they interacting, are they talking with one another. Um, I taught one course before I came back to academia for UOP, yep. and their software colors each student. So you saw the threads, each student was a different color. Yeah. And they had something, an owl, they called it owl or whatever. Yep. 
they had something in there that kept track of the posts so that the professors didn't have to keep track of it. Yeah, it is a, I mean, there are opportunities to put a GA in there and have them manipulate the discussion. Like I said before, most of my online discussions, I stay out. I'm monitoring and I'm seeing what's happening and looking for trends and themes. But the honest truth is sometimes the discussion takes on a life of its own and it's very onerous and it's time consuming. And you want to build it up so that it's not a time, you know, it doesn't suck up all your time. One of the other things that I've done in the past, granted I'm working with pre-service teachers, but I'm trying to teach them the skills needed to teach online as well. And so what I'll do is I will, in weekly discussions, I will appoint discussion directors. So I'll say, okay, this week, the two of you are the discussion directors. You go in, you run the discussion for the week. At the end of the week, you give me the grades for the students. And I say in the syllabus that I will take those grades into advisement on my grades. But then you have students in the class that they are monitoring and running the discussion for a week and then rotate that through your class. You outsourced it. I outsourced it. Well said, yeah. Do you find with those grades for discussions that students push back and say, no, I did this one or that one or his is better than mine? And how do you handle that? Yeah, with a lot of them, that's one of the challenges that we have, especially in education, but across higher ed. You know, a student will get a B plus and they're like, why did I get the A? And they're pushing for individual, you know, I got a two for this week or a two and a half, not the three. I basically just say there's an opportunity to go next time. You know, I'm not going to argue with a student about a two or a two and a half out of three on a discussion scale. It does happen all the time. But those are the same kids that I've noticed that there's, and I was listening to a podcast recently. The host of the podcast said that he knew that if I went in and I argued or talked to the professor about my grades, I always got my grade bumped up. So he's like, basically, I made it a habit that I was always in the office. And my goal was just to delay you. And once you realized that it was costing you time, you were like, all right, I'll just bump up your grades to get out of my office. Like, I can only handle so much. So I just say, if it's a two, two and a half, I'm like, look, in all of the points you're getting this semester, this is minimal. This is nothing. But you will still get complaints about it. But it's meant to make it easier. So then that gives more credence to Greg's idea about having a zero one. Yeah, in her performance assessment, sometimes I'll do the same thing with the discussion director. I put a lot of assessment on the kids. Have them self-assess themselves. Yeah, you can have them, you know, how what would you give yourself this week for the grade? Peer assessment. Peer assessment is great. I mean, having you know, I'm, I'm training teachers, I'm training people that are going to educate, and some of them will educate in online spaces. You need to run, you need to learn how to run an online discussion. So I'm outsourcing. I'm saying you, you run the discussion, you respond to your colleagues, you give the prompt for the week, you know, and then you assess the kids and then give me their grades, the students, and then give me their grades. Yes? Oh, the social dynamic that I experience with some students is that the students have stronger writing skills in the open discussion, sometimes overpower the weaker writers. Yeah. And I found that, thank you, and I found that um, it has the effect of silencing students who have uh, weaker writing yeah. skills. And how, how can we deal with that? And one of the challenges that we have in our classroom is that we want our students to internalize the content and be able to express themselves and speak, walk the walk and talk the talk, you know. And, and talk about the content. Um, part of it might be making smaller groups within the discussion thread. Um, part of it might be limiting the amount students can respond. You have to play with those dynamics because one of my hopes has always been that the online discussion provides a voice for the students that would not normally talk face-to-face in class, especially if it's tricky subjects. I, I did research in a multicultural ed class and I'm talking to students about issues of diversity and identity. And most of my students are all white, middle class. So we're talking about diversity and identity, and they're not going to come into class and just openly talk about race. And I was hoping that they would go online and talk about it. There's still challenges there. You know, some of the people that write more strongly are going to voice their, themselves. Have a little smaller discussion, pairs or dyads or triads. That's what I, um, I teach a class called Solutions Class, so yep. we do talk about race. And I have two assignments that are on 
on the, I put on the discussion board, only that I think it's beneficial to the students. I mean, I don't want them to hand in a work that I'm only going to read and grade. So I post it. They have to post it. Has to be meaningful. Has to relate to the reading and the mm -hmm. topic. And then I assign. I say one student needs to comment on it. And I guide it when I see the students are saying, like you said, oh, good work. Oh, I agree. That happened to me, but no, no meaningful. I'll go in and say it needs to be meaningful. Um, you have another opportunity to come yes. back and you know change your response. Or even when they just outline this happened, that happened, that happened. I you know I'm, you know I I go in and I say you need to. You need yeah. to be more explicit, and that is graded. So I do go in and read all of them, and I do grade them individually. What I'll regularly do, like I'll stay out of the discussions, yeah. but then what I will do is I put in the grades that I want my students to respond to each other. Um, if they don't, then I feel bad for the student that's not getting responses, and I'll go in and say, oh, three points, like what does everybody else think? So that's the only time I really get involved. Yeah. Normal uh, internet etiquette suggests that you um, don't use caps unless you want to shout. Yep. And make sure that your grammar and spelling are not embarrassing and that sort of thing. However, to promote open discussion, particularly with students who uh, are a little bit behind in terms of their literacy, particularly if they have English as a second language, you create safe zones where they can express themselves in ways that make you cringe. Um, but My students frequently make me cringe. Yeah, I, it, it matters what your assessment points are in the rubric. For me, if I, part of the challenge is also I'm training educators, and so I have a pretty, uh, a, I, I'm pretty strict on you know the etiquette, on grammars. You know they do make mistakes. You know we all have issues in higher ed looking at undergrad students and, and their writing. Um, so I try to push them on that. Um, but in the blog posts and the online discussions, I frequently do not look at spelling and grammar and usage. But then in other publications and pieces, I do look at that and I ding them on that. Um, so moving along, I wanted to talk about some of the stuff that I do. And we had the point earlier that you know this is time. And this is time that we don't have. And so I want you all to think about the fact that you do have that content area knowledge. You do have the pedagogical knowledge. You understand what you're doing. I just want you're doing this work, I want you to try and change it a little bit. So we're just talking about changing workflow, okay? So what I want you to do leaving this is I want you to think about what are opportunities for me to create digital copies, digitize new teaching and learning materials, and start with that process, and then if it's working little by little, take one class or one lecture or one, one aspect, and then you can look at, okay, my old content that I have, how can I digitize that? Okay, so on your hard drive somewhere, you have lots and lots of PowerPoints, lots and lots of PDFs, lots and lots of Word docs, 